Ladies and gentlemen, dear Asia Week uh, partners and participants, dear friends, good afternoon. Welcome to the 2018 Asia Week San Francisco Bay Area opening and symposium. My name is uh, Edward Gui. I'm the director of the Manhattan Arts. We have been uh, organizing Asia Week since uh, 2015. So this year marks the fourth year uh, of this event. There are 31 arts and cultural uh, institutions will host more than 50 events and programs uh, ranging from exhibitions, performances, uh, screenings, auctions, workshops, to uh, talks, lectures, uh, panel discussion, uh, book reading, and symposium. So jointly presenting a non-stop event field event festivity celebrating Asian art and culture across the entire San Francisco Bay Area. So I want to uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank each and every partners, participants of uh, 2018 Asian Week San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, many of you are here with us today. So I want to say a big thank you. Uh, it's been a great pleasure and honor to work with all of you. And uh, your active participation make this uh, celebration happen. So uh, would you join me to give ourselves a big round of applause? <laughs> As you see uh, from the video, uh, last year, at uh, the third edition, I studied a quote from uh, Lao Tzu, Tao Te Ching, The Way of Tao, which states like that, uh, the Tao begot one, one begot two, two begot three, and three begot ten thousand things. And I was hoping that uh, after we reaching the milestone of three, uh, we could continue uh, doing Asian Week for the many future years. But uh, will three really begot everything? I was not quite sure <laughs> at that time. But today, when seeing that uh, we doubled the uh, partners and participants as compared to what we started in 2015, and also knowing that almost all Asia-related institutions in the San Francisco Bay Area have been involved in this event. So I'm very pleased to say that Asia Week not only survived, but also thrives. So once again, I want to uh, say a big thank you to all the participants. And also I want to give a big shout out to our Asia Week manager, Lily Chen. And also <laughs> our composing coordinator, Yang Ji Wang. And also all the uh, Asia Week team. Uh, thank you for your hard work. Um, it's, it's really, really good work. Good work done. And this year will be the first year. Uh, the number four, there's an implied meaning, it's balanced and stable. We have another, again, another idiom in Chinese, si ping ba wen. <laughs> balanced as four, stable as eight. Uh, at this first year, we were able to uh, build a very balanced, a very stable platform of Asia Week, presenting well-balanced programs. But uh, on the one hand, this is something uh, to celebrate, of course. But I'm also thinking about at the other hand, should we, uh, is this all we want? Or should we just be satisfied with that? The answer to me is no. After all, we are in San Francisco Bay Area and the Silicon Valley. Constant changes and innovation are all it is about. So at this time, I hope that we will have the motivation, we will have the courage to break out from our comfort zone and to do something new every year. And as it, with all your active participation and with your, with your creative spirit, we can make uh, this Asian Week platform a lively platform, not only balanced, stable, but also constantly embracing uh, change and innovation. So, uh, here, now, as a tradition, we kick off Asian Week every year with the annual symposium. Now you can see, I already started talking about tradition. <laughs> change, so change doesn't come that easy. But uh, I think it's very important that uh, to have uh, all those Asia, uh, San Francisco uh, very interactive uh, forum of discussion among the San Francisco Bay Area institutions and their counterparts from the West, from the East Coast, and also from other parts of the world, uh, world to have a very interactive discussion. 
and common subjects. So here I would like to acknowledge uh, some special guests coming from outside the area. Among them, uh, Dr. Richard Bai, the uh, managing editor of uh, Art in America, and Ms. Lili Wei, a claimed writer, critic, and curator, and Mr. Keith Wallace, editor-in-chief of uh, Yi Shu, the uh, Journal of Tem Contemporary Chinese Art. Let's give them a warm San Francisco welcome. <laughs> and now, uh, before the uh, symposium starts, I would like also to thank uh, our two symposium, two co-hosts, uh, the Christie's and the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. <coughs> Christie's has been uh, working with us to present the symposium since uh, 2016, and the Asian Art Museum officially become an official sponsor of the symposium this year, but uh, however, the museum has been uh, active participants and strong supporter, and also I regard the museum as a flagship of Asian Week since the very beginning. So let's give the two co-hosts a round of applause. <laughs> and without further ado, I will give the floor to uh, Mr. Andrew Lip from uh, Christie's. Andrew uh, is a specialist of Chinese works of art and is regarded one of the best auctioneers of the house, which is quoted from an email of his boss, Adam Lord Gordais. <laughs> so it isn't such a wonderful thing to uh, you know, get such a recognition from the boss. So congratulations, Andrew, and now the floor is yours. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I've been asked to introduce a man who is well known to pretty much everyone here, Mr. Jay Shu, the executive director of the Asian Art Museum. Um, sometimes when people ask me why I left Chicago and moved to San Francisco, I say it's because Jay left Chicago and moved to San Francisco. <laughs> he is a familiar face to everyone because of his generosity with his time. He's not a stranger to, the, to Asia Week San Francisco, and he has been a repeated participant in this symposium as well, in other, as well as in other cultural events throughout the city. Um, Jay was even so kind as to give a lecture a few months back to the International Chinese Snuff Bottle Society. We have its director, Vince, here in the back of the California, of the uh, Northern California branch. Um, Jay was able to make connections between Chinese snuff bottles and archaic bronzes, something that's a very, a very <laughs> difficult thing to do, and we greatly appreciate having him. He's always game for whatever is going on. Um, this year marks Jay's 10th anniversary at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. In the last 10 years, Jay has helped to enrich the lives of all of us in the field of Asian art and beyond. Most recently, it's seen through the funding and construction of the new addition to the museum titled, with the campaign titled For All. It was just announced last week, excitingly, that not only will we be adding the Akiko, Yamazaki, and Jerry Yang Pavilion, but we'll also have the East West Bank Art Terrace above it. Soon, the space will be hosting new exciting exhibitions in the Bay Area's largest column tree space. Um, and Karin Ohm can speak more later about the inaugural exhibition, Creating Digital Ecosystems, a very exciting exhibition that will be the first of its type in the first quarter of 2020, so something for all of us to look forward to. On behalf of Christie's, I would like to thank Jay for his work and his generosity, and welcome him again to the podium of Asian Art Week San Francisco to officially open the fourth year. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for your extremely kind words. And um, he asked me just a day or so ago, say, Jay, give me something that I can talk to people about you. I say, well, this is a symposium, and the stars have a panelist speakers. You only need a one-liner. Jay Shi is the director of the Asian Museum. But thank you so very much. I know you did a good, great smooth work in finding out about uh, what the Asian Museum is doing. We're indeed in the middle of expanding, and uh, that's very important not only for the Asian Museum, but also for the Civic Center of the San Francisco Bay Area, but for all of us to have a larger platform that we can present, collaborate together to really making uh, San Francisco is such a dynamic magnet for Asian art and making connections globally, particularly across the Pacific, between the North America and Asia. And uh, wonderful to hear that this is the fourth year 
of uh, the Asia Week San Francisco, and uh, I did not realize it before here. Indeed, I uh, had the pleasure of participating each year and have seen it has grown tremendously. As Edward pointed out, it's 41 institutions participating. And uh, given the rate of uh, growth, I would have uh, only excited wonderment to see what next year will look like. <laughs> but I'm sure that Edward have a wonderful chance idiom for each year. So we have a one for third year, and I have one for fourth year. I'm uh, curious to hear next year, this time, what will be the idiom for the fifth year. <laughs> I'm sure it will be wonderful. And Edward is so kind to invite me every single time to say a few words of welcome to our friends from near and afar. Of course, the, um, not only 41 organizations participating in this wonderful Asia Week, but I think one signature event is very much the symposium, which really anchors the Asia Week with scholarship, with a cutting edge understanding as well as a retrospection of our field in general, and maybe the development in San Francisco Bay Area in particular. I think no Asia Week or no any other week can be truly respectable without a good symposium. And on that note, I really would like to thank um, all of the audience, all the participants, to thank our speakers from near and far. I think that is extremely important. Asia Art Museum has been delighted, honored to be a participant from the first one. And this year, and we are participating in several ways, uh, one is the exhibitions at our museum. We have right now two contemporary art Asian art show on view, one featuring the Pakistani British artist Harun Mizra. It's a highly engaging, provocative installation with sound and with light. The other is called Painting is My Everything, an art from the Mithila region of northern India. It is a wonderful story of particularly women artists, self-taught women artists, how really transform their life. Not only their own life, their community life, as well as make a huge impact on the contemporary art world through their art making. So we'd love to have you to come to see these two shows. And uh, the other way is that our uh, talented curators are participating in the symposium as well as in many other formats. Right here, as Edward already introduced, our contemporary art curator, Karen Hohn, but also, may I say, our former curator, our senior curator emeritus of Chinese art, Michael Knight, is here as well. So I think we will hear from both of them, along with the many other speakers this afternoon. So last but not least, I would like to congratulate Edward for your leadership and for the wonderful thing that you have done to really creating the Asia Week in San Francisco, I can only wonder, I can only think of the imagination, our imagination is our limit, that how far they can go. And I'd love to take a joy ride along with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. I think with that, we're ready to start with our first panel um, and with our first speaker, Betty Sue Hertz. Um, you all have heard all of our speakers' biographies in your note in your notes in the handouts. If you want to read further, um, take it home and research some of the projects that they've worked on, you can do that. Um, just as a brief introduction, Betty Sue is a curator, writer, and educator based in San Francisco, working at the intersection of visual arts, um, transcultural exchange, and social re socially relevant issues. She's currently a lecturer in the American Studies program at Stanford and, a grad at, um, and the Graduate School of San Francisco Art Institute. Hertz was Director of Visual Arts at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts until 2015, where she curated numerous large-scale and solo exhibitions, often focused on global art and political agency, and Curator of Contemporary Art at San Diego Museum of Art from 2000 to 2008. She was Curator in Residence at the Howe Museum, Shanghai, during the summer of 2018. With that, I'd like to welcome Betty Sue to the podium.
The Howe Art Museum was founded by Chinese collector, and you have to excuse my Chinese pronunciation, it's terrible, <laughs> so just bear with me. Um, Shen Hao and Yun Xiaoda have served as the director of the museum since 2012. The Howe consists of two museums. The first one in Wenzhou opened in 2013, and the Shanghai branch opened in the fall of 2017. I was the second recipient of the International First Royal Residency um, opportunity. I'm sorry, the same problem. <laughs> okay. The Howe Art Museum has been especially open to bringing Western art and design to Shanghai. Exhibitions on view during my residency were Leonardo Ehrlich, Joseph Boys, and Zaha Hadid. The extraordinary exhibition of Boys Multiples consisted of a cache of works that had been recently acquired by the museum. So it's quite unusual in, uh, in the Chinese context. Another reference for my research that I was doing in Shanghai is Shishan Mountain in Suzhou. I have been working with the Berkeley-based um, firm TLS Landscape Architecture since 2015 on a project to transform the mountain and lake and other areas around it into a state-of-the-art public park as the public art director. We are in the process of commissioning six artists create new site responsive works for the park. The concept of the park is inspired by this well-known Ming Dynasty work by Xi Ying, representing the city of Suzhou, which you see in that long strip. So that's a little introduction. I want to start with a few references. Some of them may be more specifically relevant to the artwork I will discuss, and others may be more tangential. All have been on my mind. In 1965, the British chemist turned ecologist James Lovelock was visiting NASA when they were developing programs to see if they could detect life on Mars. And from that visit emerged his idea of Gaia, named for the Greek personification of the Earth. The concept of Gaia promoted the idea of ecological systems, interrelatedness, and balance. He also promoted a mystical and spiritual belief in nature's beauty and capability. These ideas have been attractive to artists, even if some theorists and scientists have disputed the notion of harmony, noting the dangerous, violent, and out-of-balance aspects of nature. This is the image that will fuel the concept of a global, singular, ecological I've also become interested in the way literati artists approach their desire to connect to nature and its value. Many of their landscape paintings emphasize being inside of nature as a way of communing with it to achieve a utopian state of awareness and consciousness, often an expression of a life that is a rejection of urban responsibility and a removal from civil life. In the 16th century, um, it may have been possible to be inside of a safe nature and be harmonious with it or even encounter a powerful nature and sort of deal with it from a kind of human scale. In these images, the figures do not act upon nature. They do not disturb it. While we have, may have yearnings to commune with nature in this way, 
it's, it's now harder and harder. Nature itself, as a category, is now highly unstable. Not only is it endangered, it is under attack, as we know. So in recent years, I've been engaging with texts about the Anthropocene, the theory that we are in a new geological age based on human activities on the Earth's crust that is so profound as to move um, to have moved geological time into a new era. Geological time has for millions of years been primarily a process of nature cycle. And now for the first time, some suggest that it begins with the Industrial Revolution in Europe in the 18th century. It is heavily impacted by us. With the many theories that have emerged since Paul Crutzen, a chemical uh, scientist, introduced the idea, the environmental movement has begun become much more engaged with the long-term effects of human activity and an awareness of a deeper sense of time. Not only our human time, but the geological time that has a much longer durational trajectory. It is not that the Earth will not survive climate change, as it has certainly seen ice ages and such. In the end, this is still a human issue. Will we survive? That is the premise of the urgency that humans have put into motion. There continues to be wide discussion of the Anthropocene and climate change, and while Gaia has been rejected by many, um, the theorist Bruno Latour situates it not within the history of industry, but within the context of culture. So from my California perspective, I'm going to be looking at the artists and their work that I met this past week. So studio visits are a way to experience, often in an intimate setting of a studio or home or cafe, a glimpse into the artistic process and works in development. It is also a time when we hear artists speak about their intentions and what they hope to achieve. It requires an openness on the part of the curator or collector to not presuppose but to engage and listen to the artist about her work. Pictured, pictured here um, are visits with Mao Tongcheng in uh, Beijing, Li Lin Lin in Beijing, and Sheng Ran in Hangzhou. And oh yes, we took many taxis throughout all of the cities that I visited. And I have to give a shout out to the two people who really made a difference for this research project. Um, <coughs> they were helpful, supportive, and gracious and uh, including especially, as I say, uh, Juma, who is the assistant curator um, and manager of this residency program that's just starting, and Du Xiyun, who, was, who is, um, was formerly at the Howe Art Museum and is now at the Himalayan Art Museum, who insisted that, I make, uh, that he show me around and introduce me to artists in Beijing, and we spent an entire weekend going to about eight different studios together and that was purely from his own desire to share. So here are some of the artists that I'll be talking about today. What I found in China is that while there are only a few artists who are committed to this topic as a primary endeavor, such as Zhen Bao, who are uh, very much addressing ecology um, from an activist perspective, there are many other artists who are weaving uh, ecology and issues around the Anthropocene into their work. In fact, most of the artists are still embedding a concern about issues like climate change into work that engage with other aspects of culture and agency. Some approach the subject as a research project, others take a personal approach to the subject, which then makes their work more particular and less about large statements, and others are addressing new industries' encroachment on the landscape. So the first artist I'm going to talk about is Lu Um And he has been addressing environmentalism throughout his career. So this work from uh, 2006 um, focuses on commodities that were produced and then converged in Yiwu in 2006, where uh, about 212 countries and regions around the world were somehow um, having a, being able to purchase works and have them distributed um, to, to, to their area. Each day witnessed 6,000 to 8,000 foreign business people purchasing goods 
and over 1,000 outbound containers directly departed from EWU. EWU itself represented all the unexpected complexities that occurred in the dialogue between China during its new social reforms in the world. While the main topic being addressed in this work from the perspective of 2006 was the enormous production machine that China had become, we look at this work now as a representation of excessive production of plastics and the severe problem of toxic plastic dumping into the ocean. China may lead in the production of plastic goods, but it also leads in plastic pollution. So the reading of the work, while seemingly specific at the time it was created, to my mind, has shifted based on the issues that are most relevant to us today. At Jin Deshen, uh, China's capital of porcelain, people since ancient times have had a habit of smashing and dumping poorly fired pieces of porcelain. They do so in a very lackadaisical manner, leaving the shards along the river, in the street, at the door of the workshop, or in the rubbish heap. On one hand, there is a long tradition of accepting this waste as a byproduct. On the other hand, when these attitudes extend to less organic materials, we need to look differently at the impact of these practices from an environmental perspective. Lu's work during 2006-2008 wavered between the into issues around the production of commodity culture, consumerism and abundance, with works that featured raw materials, natural resources, earth, and the instability of the environment itself in relationship to the growth of cities. Set within the framework of man, you see these little figures here? <laughs> is nego negotiating his, quote, smallness compared to the great largeness of nature. As the artist says, expressing our psychological transformation and conveying a sense of contradiction. This return to nature is represented in a much more refined, reduced, and metaphoric work. Works like a reed raft, where nature's aesthetic beauty is foregrounded as a salve for consumer industry. The artist told me that around this time he started questioning his fascination with Western contemporary conceptual art and wanted to return to his deep familiarity and experience of porcelain, a material he knew from his teenage experience working with his uncle in a porcelain factory. It may be possible to use the porcelain factory as a pivot in this work, from production to the pleasurable aesthetics of porcelain, as well as its long history in China. And a recent work by Lu revisits the threat of forest fires, charred flames hovering in a large cluster that becomes a landscape of tree-like form, and then the sort of flying horizontal flames that are attached here to the wall. Genbo has been focusing, I'm just going to roll through different items here, <laughs> on ecological issues with walking tours of invasive plants, community programs, and more recently film. His community projects focus on collective ways to connect with local plants. Toad Mountain Village is one of the few remaining undocumented communities of military families that once dotted the outskirts of the city. Legacies of the complex and highly contested recent history of Taiwan, these villages were built by migrants loyal to routed Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek, who fled to Taiwan at the end of the Chinese Civil War. Most of the re residents are over 70 years old. So in order to do this project, they brought in a group of university students and other volunteers to help with this um, ecological project. And they designed a garden based on this painting. This is a painting by Kuo Tzu Hu, a Taiwanese artist from 1931. And you can see that they're trying to kind of give a feeling of that painting in, and translate it into an actual garden. Toad Commons um, consists of three zones a community garden project where native species and weeds are being cultivated in three sections, an allotment now growing edible wild plants, because you're not allowed to plant other kinds of plants there for some reason, a strip of land um, left for nature to take over, and the word echo equal, planted in wheat. These three zones also symbolize three energy styles, agriculture, foraging, and fossil fuel. In his film trilogy, 
um, teratophilia, um, Jembo explores an echo queer potential. Seven young men walk into a forest in Taiwan and engage in intimate contact with ferns. They make love to the plants, sensing each other's textures, smells, and pleasures. They rely on bodies rather than languages to build affective relations with nature. And um, these, these, these films are, are beautiful and very provocative, very, very sensual, and um, highly erotic. And this is the second one, which is even more erotic, um, where this young man is actually making love to the fern. So um, one thing to note is that Sigmund Freud had a phobia against ferns, and so uh, Jembo is aware of this and wants to subvert and reverse the phobia by encouraging his actors to make love to them. And here's an installation shot of the second one. He's, he's working on the third one now. <coughs> and, uh, I would just like to interject here that almost all the artists that I visited had moved their studio in the last year or were, were about to have to move out of their studio, especially in Beijing. Many of the artists were living in an area that was raised by the government, and almost everyone had moved into their studio um, within three months of when I uh, visited there. And those who are no who are still in their old studios will be having to move in the next year. So there's a huge amount of instability um, in terms of the studios where, where people are living. And they're, I must say, they, they, they handle a lot better than I think I would if I had to move so often. So for the, uh, and I mentioned that because Lu Xuan had been living in Beijing and recently moved to an arts district um, in Shanghai. For the past few years, Lu Xuan has been uh, visiting Bitcoin mining sites around China. He is developing a project in several parts, including maps and film. In the dry season of winter, the Bitcoin mining machine is transported from southern China to eastern parts of Xinjiang, where there is a surplus of wind power. In the spring, the machine is then transported to Mongolia, where coal is produced in large quantities. And finally, as summer approaches, it is shipped to flood regions in the south, such as Sichuan. The primary base for the research, development, and production of mining uh, machines is located in the Special Economic Zone of Shenzhen, where the machines are constantly upgraded to accommodate demand to increasing computing power. <coughs> for sites where bitcoins are found, their surrounding regions tend to have an unusually dense concentration of ethnic minorities. Contemporary technology is restructuring their local culture and their resources, and currently where regions are undergoing infrastructural engineering of immense scale, aspects of nature and culture are disintegrating and being restructured at an accelerating speed. So the film that's in, sort of in progress um, is tracing and comparing the journey of these minorities with the Bitcoin mining. Uh, the film also engages with the research of ethnomusicologists uh, who have been uh, researching these, um, <coughs> these minority, uh, ethnic minority musical traditions, which then gets blended into the film. But the image on your right, the image here of the landscape, um, this has um, all been sort of re-engineered in order to power this, this, this bit, Bitcoin um, machinery here, and it's um, causing great dis disruption to the landscape around it, um, um, and obviously having an impact not only on people, but on the animals as well. So um, next I'm going to talk about a young artist in her 20s, Lee Lin Lin, a uh, graduate of CAFA, um, who um, is one of those artists who had to move her studio. Um, and she is um, working from a very subjective point of view. Her work tangles a foreboding quality of weird nature with a psychological mapping of uneasy struggle, anger, and stress, from which, um, from a much more subjective perspective than most of the other artists that I talk about. There is a slippage between illusion and reality. The artist constructs her sculptures and installations to reflect on her feelings that the world is full of absurdity and lies. 
even though there is a bit of warmth and beauty still to be found. The iron cage is much like the world we find ourselves in today, she says. Not a single person has the luck to escape from the, quote, huge iron cage. As I found in, um, not only in her text and her speech, um, but others as well, a, a real, uh, a w the way that they talk about this work is actually not in the terms that I'm talking about today. Most people are talking about what I would call existential issues. Where am I in this? How do I manage my fear of, of the unknown and things like that? Um, <clears throat> um, so I, I found it interesting that while I would talk about this in terms of ecology and the environment, that um, the artist generally didn't in the case of someone like Lee Lin, who does not really talk about that, even though to me this is completely obvious that this is so much part of her work. The clawing moss parasitically clinging to rocks and other plants, the bat dancing with the plant, the glass bulb, which is kind of barely visible here, the encasement, the feeling of suffocation, all accrue into a tension between the natural and post nature. So in another turn, Yi Jin Tong's work is centered on his fascination with fishing, a new endeavor that is the source for his recent artwork. He has taken thousands of photographs of the quasi-natural areas surrounding the fishing sites off the shoreline or marginalized sectors of Brooklyn, which contrast sharply with the familiar images of New York's glittery skyline. And I know you can't really see this, but I just want to show you the multiplicity. <laughs> Um, of, the, uh, of the cityscape. These images become source material for his eclectic montage tapestry in mean, these works downstairs. He writes, fishing brings me to the remote peripheries of the city where ruins replace buildings and nature's reclamation is surprisingly ubiquitous. He then carefully stitches together this image from his own photographs infused with received images from science, history, and archaeology into what could almost be a contemporary addition to the ancient Chinese encyclopedia of mythological and fantastical animals, the classical book of mountain and sea. The abandoned, the detritus, and forgotten and lost things float and sink in the waterways near the shore. While collage and the accumulation of detritus play a dominant role in the tapestries. His videos, also downstairs, offer another view of fishing off the shores of New York, another aesthetic approach to the dirty waters around the city. As an amateur fisherman, it is in the everyday encounters with pollution that is not central to the storyline, but almost assumed to be part and parcel of the experience. In this series of work, inspired by the summer flood in China's Jiangxi province, pictured at the top of this slide, Kunlin He interprets these themes by combining the source imagery from media with imaginary elements of the flood's destruction, the human toll, and what it leaves behind. Living in San Francisco, He has also created works that express the devastation of the California wildfires presented in two registers. In a drone video over a ruined home with a fake rocket-like firing, which is stuff here, uh, indicating the warlike situation of climate change destruction. And in his Shanshui influence works where he depicts the damage in a more surreal and disjointed and fragmented representation. For the artist, these decimated scenes are reminiscent of traditional Chinese landscape paintings in their emotional charge and otherworldliness, contemplating the power of nature's violence in light of our role in the new globally warmed reality underlines this disturbing comparison. In his drawings, it's both translation and collage, imagination, that reveal the status of the landscape. No direct political statement is, about, is made about human activities that have um, exacerbated climate change as inference is at play here, and subtle and coded signs of what would broadly be called politics. And finally, I want to introduce you to this work by Lu Zhenshen, who lives in Shanghai, and another artist who recently moved to, um, there um, from Europe, 
Um, he had been living in Paris, and then um, Nietzsche was Dusseldorf, I think, or uh, Hamburg, or Hamburg, um, and had recently moved to Shanghai. So this is a project he did for Nuit Blanche, an annual festival um, that takes place in Paris every year, where he created a temporary installation of ice monuments. As the theme of the festival was climate change, and the festival took place a few weeks before the United Nations Climate Change Conference called COP21, his work intersected with global politics and policy, but in a very open and playful way. The conference that took place weeks after the installation negotiated the Paris Agreement, a global agreement on the reduction of climate change the text of which represented a consensus of the representatives of the 196 parties attended. Installed for one day, the ice was in a constant state of melting during its presentation. It was protected along the perimeter by ropes uh, during sort of the main part of its presentation, arranged in a grid into five sections. It also alluded to various continents that would be represented at the then upcoming conference. So you see it's like in five different sort of clusters here. However, at the end of the evening, the public came into the installation area. Some knocked down the ice, others took the fallen ice and began to build their own sculptures with it. In effect, the public participation was not of the planned and controlled event, but it was inevitable in such a public place that people would take control of the ice and play with it either destructively or constructively. The following morning, the city's sanitation department came and completely cleaned the area. Very soon, there was no trace of these sculptures, except in photos like these and in memories of those who attended. It was a powerful and playful way to bring attention to the importance of COP21, but also <coughs> to the ephemerality of the ice the installation spoke um, also of the ephemerality of life itself, especially as we face the ecological challenges ahead. My brief survey conveys the many ways that Chinese artists are expressing their concerns about the environment, often inspired by research and stories of destruction as well as personal experience. They are finding new ways to bring attention to how climate change and the Anthropocene is affecting our material life but also our consciousness about the value of landscape, the fragility of the environment, and the role, the human role in its precarity and the psychic toll on all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I should point out we are going to have a panel discussion after our three presenters, and that will be the time um, for the presenters to speak with each other and then also for questions from the audience too. So if you have any, any thoughts or questions or anything that you'd like to ask the presenters as they're speaking, jot it down and we'll, we'll circle back at the end. Our next presenter is Karen Owen, who serves as the Asian Art Museum's first full-time assistant curator of contemporary art. In addition to building the museum's new modern and contemporary department, she is currently co-curating co the exhibition Kimono Revisited which will open in February 2019. Um, and recently opened the immense new media installation, Harun Mirza, The Night Journey, in September 2018, which is still on view and available for everyone to go and visit. Over the course of the next two years, Karin will be curating several exhibitions in new spaces at the Asian, dedicated to contemporary art as part of the museum's transforma transformation project. These projects include the outdoor rooftop terrace, activating the museum's historic loggia with contemporary artworks by emerging artists, and planning for a new gallery dedicated to the museum's growing contemporary art collection. Dr. Owen holds a PhD in history, theory, and criticism of art and architecture from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an MA in modern art history, connoisseurship, and art market history from Christie's Education, and a BA in urban studies with honors, art history minor from Stanford. And Karen will be delivering a talk titled Reforming Modern Contemporary art in the Asia. The Asia. Asian art.
simultaneously global and local and also a completely beautiful day outside. So <laughs> <laughs> spending some of it inside with us. Um, I have entitled my talk Reforming to consider the idea that um, there is the idea that there's formation, but then there's always continual reformation. So we're talking about whether it's a uh, collection at an institution or the canon in general, or sort of our own points of view. And that's something that I think um, is really important to consider, um, specifically because of, um, in a museum or an institutional context, there tends to be so much so much uh, assumption that things are the way they are, or perhaps have always been, um, but that's um, just one part of the story. I'm also kind of interested in the idea of reform, um, the reform movement in China, which is uh, one of the areas that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, but then, you know, really the idea of reforming, you know, um, not necessarily in a political sense, but it's difficult to not think of politics these days. Um, you know, the idea of, you know, things that really do change in this world. And part of the work that I've been doing at the Asian is really trying to come up with um, ways of invade, uh, invading new territories, providing invitations for artists to, um, at times, sort of interlocutors, and to also, you know, offer um, means of communication, not necessarily in the sort of East-West dialogue that seems to be very embedded in the work of Asian art history um, for at least 100 years, but also really thinking, uh, what does global mean? what are these other kinds of important dialogues that need to happen, and particularly sort of East, east or, you know, the, the sort of dialogues within Asia that are important. So that being said, I wanted to start with these two images, um, both of which are sort of important touch points for me uh, as a historian and curator, um, and then also as, you know, sort of ways of thinking about how museums can deal with contemporary artists, because I think we all know that it's not necessarily a natural relationship. So on the left, we have a uh, sh shot from outside of the National Art Museum of China in Beijing in 1979, the STARS um, exhibition outside, sort of installed on the, the sensing around the museum, um, sort of after the, um, the fashion of the Salon de Tresuse, or this sort of tradition in modern art where there is sort of the, the state or the museum or the institution that is sort of not open to the maybe slightly more avant-garde or radical elements um, of the world around them, and particularly of contemporary artistic production. On the right, we have um, sort of the exact opposite, the presentation of personal museums to a handful of contemporary Chinese artists in 2007 in Yijian and in Sichuan. So not the center of the art world in China, not the center of the art world anywhere. You can see uh, Wu Shangzhuan at the far right in his sunglasses and long hair, kind of looking confused at the flag that was just awarded to him, Don Pei Li sitting or standing next to him. I mean, this is this really interesting moment of, you know, sort of the um, a, a government, not the government, a sort of provincial government sort of trying to harness the, um, you know, real success of contemporary Chinese art or particular artists. Um, this is in the era when the art market was really, really heating up. This is also the lead up to the 2008 Olympics and sort of trying to stake a claim on that success by granting these artists their personal museums. I, I spoke with John Lee not long after this and you know, his, his thought was, you know, first of all, it was sort of awesomely ironic. Um, and secondly, that, you know, for, for him as a practicing artist and particularly as someone who had come up through the Fine Art Academy system and you know, in his case he was from the cohort at the Jijun Academy of Fine Arts in the 1980s, um, you know, a lot of um, him, you know, Hu Shang a lot of these, these artists were uh, majoring in oil painting basically because it was the closest thing to something different and experimental that they could find and then immediately upon graduating really launched into sort of experimental new media um, practices. So for them the idea of a museum is that it's often a place where art is in tombs or where it goes to die. Um, and you know, this is something that I keep in mind as I am thinking actively about the collections, um, exhibitions, and programs. I'll speak much less about the programs um, in the interest of time. Um, but are happening right now at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. 
um, just because you know it is it is really about finding a, a balance that makes sense and then also being willing to shift that balance at any given time in order for museums to have a really robust and I think you know a positive uh, contribution to you know the art of any given time period is to sort of acknowledge that in any given moment it's both history and historiography that um, that live together that we need to understand what are the lenses through which we're considering things um, and how are we talking about them, how are we presenting them, or in many cases in the museum world, uh, why are they in storage for decades at a time? Because there are plenty of wonderful things that are part of the collection that go into storage and don't necessarily have a relationship to the public. Um, so that being said, um, thank you for the introduction, Andrew. That was lovely. Um, I also wanted to just share a little bit more about myself. Many of you uh, know me very well. Some of you don't. Um, and I just wanted to offer that, you know, I think that the idea of subjectivity being present, um, you know, both in a historiographical sense and just really in a personal sense because, you know, museums or institutions are thought of as these great big things, but they really are the work of a handful of individuals at any given time. And so I just wanted to sort of share a little bit more about my own personal biases and the things that have shaped me. As Andrew mentioned, I chose to uh, attend my first graduate program was a terminal master's offered through Christie's. And Part of the reason why I did that in New York at the time was that I had just graduated from Stanford in the late 90s. I was, you know, studying modern and contemporary art, and um, this was a time when Inside Out New Chinese Art, the sort of, you know, groundbreaking exhibition of contemporary Chinese art, was shown both in New York and then later in San Francisco. And, you know, I was sort of running around to various universities saying, you know, what can you offer in terms of creating, you know, a way for talking about this type of work, and it seemed like there was the sort of cadre of Chinese art historians that would say that's kind of the domain of the modernists, and the modernists who would largely say, well, I mean, that's not really something that we're prepared to do because it's a little bit outside of this, you know, really robust conversation that we're having, mostly centered on sort of the modernist trajectory from Paris to New York. So the act of disruption, sort of punk rock move that I made was to do it with and that's just something that I wanted to, you know, sort of offer there. It's a, you know, it's a way of looking at things that's uh, art history, but also connoisseurship history of the art market, and you know, very sort of active dialogue with um, the, the sort of New York art world, the collectors, the things that are not necessarily always made public, and also looking at a lot of different types of things, and not just things that have made their way into the canon or museum collections, but large bodies of stuff. And some of it's interesting for weird reasons, and some of it's super. Um, on the other end, I you know, studied at uh, MIT for my uh, PhD, which is all about sort of history, theory, criticism, and ways of making um, sort of interesting and important, and in some cases, unintuitive connections across um, cultures, across times, um, really sort of understanding the interplay between architecture, <coughs> art, um, visuality, um, things of that nature. And so, you know, once again, this is sort of trying to create the world that I would like to not necessarily going through a traditional art history trajectory, and that's part of what I'm bringing to the museum. I mean, oddly, I'm also, you know, in my personal history, my family <coughs> on one side, I'm roughly descended from John Adams, and on one side, I'm roughly descended from Madame Wellington Coo. If <laughs> anyone knows the Republican <laughs> era, Oi Hui Lan, Madame Wellington Coo was, you know, the daughter of one of the, you know, famous crazy rich Asians of the late 19th century, early 20th century. And so all this is to say, I have various kinds of generational uh, privilege and access and you know, a real sort of home um, in academia and in the art world. Um, and it, as, as such, I was able to make a choice to be active in creating the, um, the art world that I would like to see sort of shaped and changed. And it was a move that I was able to make I think in a way that many Asian Americans of my generation would not feel comfortable doing. I think that there is sort of the, the uh, acknowledgement that the, the work that is happening in the cultural sphere is kind of nice and interesting, but that you know a real sort of successful career would involve perhaps going to medical school, sorry, Dad, um, <laughs> or law school. And um, I think that it's one of those things that I do carry with me as I am doing my work at the Asian, is that I am trying to create something that um, perhaps my peers uh, would like to see happen, but just do not feel either like it's part of their domain or that there is um, a place for them in that uh, in that 
realm. So that being said, I'd like to take you through some of the things that have happened in the past few years. I've been at the Asian Art Museum since 2015. Um, uh, Edward has kindly invited me to participate in this for the past four years. One year I was in New York, one year I was in Shanghai. Last year I had a baby, and so <laughs> here we are. Um, and I can take you through things that have actually um, sort of come to pass in relatively short order. So, um, you know, I didn't know where the overlaps would be, but Betty, so this is kind of exciting that we have this mutual interest in Liu Jianhua, and, you know, this is his site specific installation and collected letters that was a, an extremely generous gift from the Society for Asian Art to the Asian Art Museum um, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the museum in 2016. So this is a, uh, a site-specific word in the original sense of the, the term where um, the work you know, really cannot exist anywhere else other than this original site. He visited the museum, was very struck by the idea that it had once been the San Francisco Public Library. And um, particularly the historical areas like this loggia space, which is more or less on the second floor when you enter the museum um, up the grand staircase, the uh, upper lintels are inscribed with these maxims from you know, the, the goal of the public library being a place where knowledge could be accessed. And there's also sort of a moral component that public education was going to sort of lift people up individually um, and collectively. So his response in creating this installation where the uh, mixed uppercase, lowercase Latin letters and uh, Chinese radicals are literally sort of falling from the ceiling is, you know, an interesting response to the more or less both art neoclassical architecture, but also to the idea that there is, you know, this way of housing uh, knowledge and uh, 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 collections of cultural value, whether they be books in a library or the works of art in a museum, um, they're brought together and then, you know, there's also, you know, this sort of uh, nonsensical uh, arrangement of things that, that won't necessarily always come together to be something that's crystal clear or readable. I mean, he's also extremely sensitive to space, extremely sensitive to material. He was very interested in the idea that this was going to be in uh, eye shot of historical works of art, particularly porcelain from Jing Dijun, which uh, that he very kindly already gave you the background that he does have a personal relationship to Jing Dijun and um, specifically uh, porcelain sculpture, where he uh, learned to make uh, figures. Um, often, uh, I believe he said he had a, a repertoire that included Guan Yin in a sort of whiteware context um, in his teenage years when he was really sort of learning um, on what was called a porcelain factory floor before he went to art school. And, you know, the, the process of um, working with him and documenting this in the catalog where I do also discuss Yi Wu's survey, um, you know, is really looking at his relationship to, to the mass quantities of these things that are produced, but also, you know, his sort of sensitivity to their individuality. And you can kind of see this on the lower left. You see him sort of, you know, really um, taking time with the clay in the mold, which is, you know, itself produced through this laser cutting process. So it's not like it's sort of revisiting a completely artisanal world, but it's really sort of trying to engage with, you know, where is um, the intersection of the sort of um, handmade or the artist's touch when you're still looking at these really, really large quantities of material. Uh, also in 2016, um, there were two exhibitions that opened roughly simultaneously in November of that year, which we can all recall was a particularly stressful time <laughs> for many of us. Um, and uh, the sculptural turn, which I'm representing with the exhibition brochure here on the left, and Koki Tanaka Potters and Poets, which was a temporary exhibition of work that you know was installed in our temporary exhibition gallery that's nestled in um, between our permanent collection of Japanese and Korean art. Um, were on view sort of on the same floor and, and roughly close together. And it was important to me as, as someone who works with contemporary material to be able to have a dialogue where you're looking at really different ends of artistic production, but also how they kind of overlap. So in the case of the sculptural turn, it's a uh, collection um, that was uh, amassed by uh, Phyllis Kempner and David Stein, two uh, local psychologists who have had a real uh, affinity for an, a serious interest in uh, the contemporary ceramic production of Japan for about 15 years. Uh, this is a work by Mihara Mihar Ken, this is Kishi Eiko, this is Ogawa Machiko, and so is this. And for, for my eye, it's both sort of interesting to see, you know, technically how really, really controlling and sort 
sort of difficult this process has to be, but then also, you know, how it's this sort of micro window into a type of artistic production that's very much in conversation with global art production, with earthworks, with minimalism, um, with a lot that has happened in the, particularly in the post-war period when many of these artists were growing up, um, but also, you know, usually not part of the conversation of sort of mainstream global contemporary art and kind of seeing, you know, where, where the biases are, you know, how these works, which are in general kind of diminutive, they are collected by collectors who live in San Francisco and have a relatively small home, so that's one of the things that goes into them, and yet they are still really quite powerful. This one from her Lunar Fragment series is, you know, some of my favorite work. It, you know, involves a porcelain body and, you know, glass, so, so the glaze itself is no longer sort of this, this silky coating of the work, but rather this actual sort of craggy um, material that has its own life, and all of it is, you know, very much, um, you know, the, some of the most sort of precious materials that we see in particularly Asian art history, but sort of rendered in this way that has a lot to do with um, geology, with the, the world we live in, and also with the sort of rugged um, aesthetic. So uh, I thought it was really important to have something that would be sort of an interesting counterbalance to that, and I found that in the work of Koki Tanaka, who many of you probably know, he represented the um, Japan at the Venice Biennale in, I believe it was 2013, um, and he has these series of sort of collective acts where he's really acting as someone who is convening people and then documenting the experience of taking um, something that they have in common, whether it's a profession or an avocation, and then asking them to do it together. So in this case, this is um, five potters sort of instructed to simultaneously create a piece of ceramic. These are um, Beijing potters who are working in one of the potters' studios. But um, uh, Koki himself, while he's interested in relational aesthetics and the idea of capturing the dialogue and the sort of frictions between people um, in collaboration, you know, sort of looking at that as a microcosm of, you know, coming together as a society and particularly in times of crisis. This is all sort of a post-tsunami uh, body of work for him. Um, you see, you know, evidence of the collaboration. You see the things that are all, that are actually made, which, um, you know, for, for five professional ceramicists, <laughs> I think the results are, are awesomely awkward. <laughs> and um, I think it, it says a lot about, you know, how the, the sort of element of control of um, being able to sort of be a single author is actually very much embedded into um, the artistic process for, for many contemporary artists. Um, you know, the, the entire sort of uh, setup that resembles reality TV in certain ways is interesting. But, you know, hearing how the, the conversation um, goes in these really, really philosophical directions, trying to get people on the same page to accomplish what is essentially a simple task of making a pot. This is something that they do professionally every day. Um, it was just a really sort of, I think, interesting way of, of looking at, you know, how um, sometimes the pot is not just a pot. And this is a gallery shot of how we installed in the Tadayuchi thematic gallery on the second floor in the Asian Art Museum, where again, it's, it's, you know, we have the evidence, we have the work, but we really also just want it to be a place sort of the, the process can happen, where the sort of deconstructed aesthetic that Koki and a lot of his um, uh, generation of artists who are really looking at boxes very seriously, who are looking at, you know, sort of the evolution of art from being in the rarefied art world into being something that might actually have a little bit more um, relationship to the uh, current events in the world we see, you know, rather than hanging um, uh, works on paper that are framed um, on the wall, they're sort of propped up against the wall. He was kind of specific about these IKEA couches that were part of <laughs> the installation. So this is, um, you know, a very, uh, you know, it, it looks sort of pared down, but all of it is sort of part of the artistic um, choice and aesthetic. And it was important to me when working with the artist that, you know, the title of the show is Koki Tanaka Colon Potters and Poets. The other um, collective project was Five Poets writing a, a poem simultaneously. Is that it's not just about these works. It's about these works sort of and his practice as a whole as kind of an offering to visitors to think about things, to think about artworks, and to think about the world in maybe a slightly different way. And we did donate the couches to SFAI grad students afterwards, so hopefully there have been productive naps and <laughs> <laughs> offered, um, you know, sort of further artistic creation after that. Um, I will take you very briefly through a few different things that happened in 2017. Um, many of you might know that a lot of our um, um, exhibitions, the future exhibitions that have been sort of uh, coming up through 
through the museum's pipeline these past few years are really drawn from our permanent collection as a goal of really being able to show things in a pan-Asian manner, so getting them you know, out of their particular cultural context and looking at things a little bit more thematically, and then sort of trying to consider how to add um, elements from contemporary art production. So in the case of Flower Power, we had the galleries with the historical artworks um, more or less separate from the contemporary artworks. We had a few painted or a few prints by Takashi Murakami. We had a digital installation by the Japanese collective Team Lab, who's the artist uh, author of the first show that will launch our new pavilion in uh, 2020. Um, and then we also had some uh, installations in the court space of the museum. So this is North Court. It's a large atrium space. It's not the space of the gallery. We um, worked with Ayomi Yoshida, who's um, another artist who has you know, her own lineage. She's a, from the printmaker Yoshida family, um, but is particularly invested in looking at cherry blossoms and the cherry trees and sort of their life life cycle, their relationship to climate change, um, and so sort of taking it outside of the, the printer's studio and into a three-dimensional space, um, and the work of Lei Ming Wei, which was um, sort of brought to us via my colleague Mark Mayer, who had a really meaningful engagement with Lei Ming Wei um, for many years, and we were able to install the Moving Garden, which is a sort of granite, uh, large granite piece with a sort of channel for flowers um, in the middle of it, which actually requires participation where visitors were asked to take a flower on your way out leave the museum, take a slight detour from wherever you're going next, um, and then offer the flower just as a gift to a stranger. No strings attached, but it's a kind of a funny thing in that we don't really have a lot of uh, interactions like that in our society, and so it's like, you know, you, you know how to act when you're just sort of paying for a cup of coffee or, you know, doing something that sort of involves a sort of scripted transaction, but it's really difficult to figure out how to give a gift to a stranger, um, and that was, you know, one of those um, aspects that, you know, it was to us to find um, works of contemporary art that were not just really about flowers, but were kind of about more, you know, what are the relationships between flowers and people and how we live. Um, also in 2017, I just want to sort of highlight there are some big things and there are some small things that we do. And for me, it's really important to have uh, modern and contemporary art sort of part of the larger dialogue. So it might not necessarily be 100% of the time, but I think sometimes when appropriate, having contemporary works of art alongside um, traditional works of art in this case this was um, installed in the Qing Imperial Art Gallery. Michael, okay? <laughs> Maybe. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, you know, work by Yang Bing Hui and Gu Wen Da, sort of, you know, both of them playing with traditions, um, whether you can sort of see it right away or not. They're looking at landscape, they're looking at ink painting, they're looking at calligraphy and sort of troubling that. Um, and these are the types of sort of interesting small moments that we can have that don't This is in the South Asian Arts Gallery, um, a collaboration by Shavit Sikander and Ayat Akhtar. The title is a Portrait of the Artist, and uh, the concept is that, you know, this is them um, sort of uh, thinking about, you know, you can see some sort of outlines of historical figures about the idea of creation, and particularly um, the Prophet Muhammad, his sort of journey, the mystical night journey that is considered sort of a, a creative force in, in Islam and for um, Art Gallery, we were able to show some of uh, Tetsuya Noda's diary series, um, and to me it was important that we were able to just show this work and talk about his series and talk about, you know, kind of what his observations have been, which is, you know, this really sensitive look at his daily life that in some cases is kind of small and in some cases is kind of big. Um, it's interesting that, you know, he is accorded the title of living national treasure in Japan, but, you know, someone who's given about 80 words to write about an artist, um, I didn't think that was necessarily something that we needed to share, and so I'm sort of thinking about really, you know, where do we want to sort of praise artists and give them the credit that they are due, and when do we want their art and their sort of practice to speak for itself, sort of outside of that language of privilege and sort of the, the insider status of someone who would know what a living national treasure is. Similarly, in the Southeast Asian Arts Gallery, I was able to acquire this interesting work by the Propeller Group, the Antique Dragon Spacecraft, which you can see installed in the gallery there in a way that, you know, it's the intention is not to use the historical artwork as a backdrop 
or to have the contemporary art be a punchline or to suck the oxygen out of the room, but really to have work on view together that is interesting and that makes sense. So in this case, you can see a sort of a you know quasi-futuristic spacecraft that's made from an amalgamation of a historical roof beam um, and some uh, contemporarily carved pieces that are fitted to these sort of tail fins and other aspects of this um, strange spacecraft. Um, the works of art that contain a component of sound complete of problems because we have, you know, this type of animation work by Shiva Amadi on view, you know, in a gallery with no other works that create sound. So is it sort of a fair way of um, integrating the contemporary and the historical? In this case, because of the particular nature of the soundscape, I felt like it was okay. I would not necessarily always want to do that. Um, in 2018, in the earlier part of this year, we had another exhibition that really was an experiment in trying to have the um, works of art together in this way. So very much the opposite of how flower power has them separate. In this case, we wanted them to be 100% integrated, looking at very, very large issues of life, of where humans sort of fit in the universe, the relationship between the divine and the human. And as you can see aesthetically, a lot of these works um, don't necessarily go together, but conceptually, I think they were actually kind of wonderful and beautiful and harmonious. Um, in terms of things that are happening now or soon, the Haroon Mirza Night Journey, which is you know another sort of investigation of this, um, this uh, aspect of the Hadith, of the words and, pro and, and uh, views of the Prophet, um, that's being sort of reinvestigated by a contemporary artist, in this case Haroon Mirza, who is a sort of composer of things, of sound electronics and things like very cheap rebonded foam or cheap uh, carpet. Um, all synthesized via a, a bespoke media device that is able to translate a two-dimensional image. In this case, it is a historical painting in our collection of the Prophet Muhammad on the night journey, um, synthesizing that into a choreographed experience of light and sound. And so, you know, this is the type of thing that is it's dematerialized and confusing and somewhat destabilizing, and to me, a really important way of working with artists to um, not just, you know, help them sort of explore their own practice, but really sort of reinvestigate, you know, what is this relationship between historical and contemporary works. Um, coming soon, we will have a very large um, installation of the Yoshitomonara Your Dog sculpture, which will greet visitors on the front steps of the museum. And so, you know, sort of marking the place of the museum, so to speak, um, in the Civic Center, which is still um, the kind of place where it's hard to necessarily pick that museum out from the other federal buildings. So that being said, I just wanted to close with this sort of non-action installation shot of how we've invited people to experience the night journey. In the first gallery, you, you do see the works on paper. You see his, his engagement with historical um, Islamic uh, painting from India from around you know, the 18th century, 19th century. Um, and in the next, on the right, you see the actual modified installation where he's taken uh, Marshall Cab speakers, LED lights, and created this overall immersive experience where we really are asking visitors to just do things differently. We're asking them to walk around, to sort of sit down, lie down, um, experience it from different um, points of view. And that's where I am today. Um, so I will <laughs> turn it back over to the panel and um, um, skip the last couple slides. So I kind of my <laughs> reserve section in case there was time, which there never is. So thank you all for this. Dr. Michael Knight. Michael is a private curator of Asian art based here in San Francisco in the Bay Area. From 96 to 2014, he served as the senior curator of Chinese art at the Asian. Um, prior to coming to the Asian Art Museum, Dr. Knight spent 15 years in various curatorial roles at the Seattle Art Museum. He also taught four years at the University of Washington. He received his PhD in Chinese art history in 1992, Masters of Philosophy in 86, and Masters of Art from Columbia, and his Bachelors of Art from Willamette University. The primary area of expertise are early Chinese art, Chinese lacquer, and Chinese furniture. We're very privileged to have him here with us today as he is returning from a trip to Hong Kong and a quick one-day trip to London, which wrapped up last night. 
So he's going to uh, give a, a bit of an amended uh, presentation, and he told us he, was, he had limited time to prepare, so that we said we wanted him in whatever capacity he could offer. So, welcome, Dr. Michael Knight. Okay, so just a little bit, uh, um, Andrew did a very good job, thank you very much, of introducing who I am. Uh, I worked in museums for 31 years, and four years ago, I retired from the Asian Art Museum, which is still one of my, my great loves, and went on to work in the, in the private world as a private curator. Um, one of the first things to, to start with is to define what a private curator means. I'm not an art consultant so I don't go and tell people what they should collect. Um, I actually have four clients, and I deal with the private collections. So I do, I do advise them, I do help them buy, but also the vast majority of what I do is after purchase. So installations, uh, exhibitions, they're going to land the exhibitions. I become in part the curator's nemesis, the registrar, where I'm the person who says, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and one of the big no's in the private world is um, and that was one of the major ch transformations that I had to do going from being in a public institution to being to working in the private world. Um, if you're at the Asian Art Museum, the first thing you want people to do is know who you are, what you have, and to have them come there. If you're a major private collection, a major private collector, the last thing you want to have, the last thing I want my, my collectors to have is people coming in their house, people asking to have access to their collections, or putting out any kind of images of the interiors of their homes, in a public and a public venue. I'm not showing any images of my clients' homes. So I'm not able to do that. Which actually made it very difficult. I've been the one who's been telling you, no, 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 don't do that. Somebody asked me to give a talk on my my collectors do and I said, no, 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 you can't do that. So I can't show you many images. I have to show no images of the homes of my of my collectors. My world has gone from marketing to non disclosure agreements. It's a it's a very big change. So um, all of my collectors, I have four, four clients that I work for, three of them are major, major players in the Asian art world and the contemporary art world, in a private, in a public sense. So they do major private uh, programs. A lot of the kind of philosophical issues that were being dealt with uh, by the previous uh, speakers in this panel, they may be supporters of those things in their public persona, but in their private persona, they collect things that they live with. So that kind of institutional and private uh, capacity is very different, and their personas are happen to be very different in their public and in their private collecting habits and what they may or may not support. <coughs> the changes again from being public and being private. Now, I've done this for four years now, and this is actually kind of an opportunity opportunity for me to think what the changes are and what I've what I've looked for and what I have recommended that my clients hire me when I came out of the museum world into their private world to help them curate. I would have said no, because I didn't know what it meant to be a private curator. It's a very, very different world. So when you're looking at working in a, in a public institution, what you're talking about is getting people in, getting the flow in through a gallery. This happens to be an exhibition that was at the Cantor over the summer. And this is from, this is a private collection show from one of my my primary clients, um, I'd never looked at the things this way uh, in the home because we don't show that many at any given time. We don't talk about where does the label go, what's the, what's the crowd flow, how do you get people in, what, what are the concepts, what are you talking about. Um, we don't do that. That's not part of what our, our the interior, what we do in the, in the home. The home is very different. In the home, the concerns are my daughters love to play around on hoverboards, and if we put that work on paper up on that wall, they're going to run into it and tear it, and we're not going to have it anymore. Uh, or they may even say, we shouldn't collect that because we cannot show it because my girls love to play around on hoverboards. So the, the entire concept of collecting, the entire concept of curating, the entire concepts of installation are different. They're almost antithetical to each other. They're almost the other side around. Those big kind of philosophical issues, um, um, people often come to me and say, why don't you have my, your collector buy this particular work? 
uh, why doesn't your collector collect in this particular area? And my answer is going to be, well, if they can't fit it in their home, why would they own it? Uh, talk to an institution, have them buy it for an institution. But you know why clients don't have a major place to show a video. So why would they collect video? They may have a video or two, but they're going to be in their collection to be lent to public institutions. They don't have a space to show video. They're not going to have video in their, in, their, in their private collection. By and large, they're dealing with things, they're collecting things that they live with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that is an entirely different world. When you look at a, where's the little, sorry. You've got it. <laughs> Museums are built for people to get around in. They're built for the display of art, one hopes. One fights with museum architects all the time, yes. So uh, sometimes they're more or less successful depending on the architecture and the architect. But private homes are built to be lived in. Uh, and they're going to have rooms with specific purposes. Very rarely are private homes designed as galleries. So, you know, in a, in a museum a space like this, an interior space, you've got the, the luxury of having lighting systems that are dedicated and designed to show art. You've got wall systems that can move around. You've got, you can control the light, light levels. You can, you can deal with various kinds of materials in the same space without having to worry about major changes in the environment and so on and so forth. In a home, you've got a living room. You've got a study. You've got a formal room. You've got a casual room. You've got people living there, moving through. Um, you can't do that. You can't do it in the same way. The spaces for displaying the art are limited and set. They're not flexible. They're inflexible. Um, the issues are rather actually quite fundamental and quite challenging. Um, when you design a home, you, the architects usually think about their big, their big statement, their big feature. They very rarely think about how the art is going to work within that space. So if you have, let's say, just take this nice little room here, well, obviously, you don't have flexible walls. You're not going to move things around. Uh, you have a big window back there, so you have daylight coming into the space. Windows are a, a difficult thing in a private home because in California, where architects talk about that wonderful play between interior and exterior space and natural light and all the kinds of things you want to have in a living environment. Well, if you're collecting major works on paper, you can't hang them on windows, and you can't hang them in front of windows. If you hang it on a window, you can't hang them on them. That's physically impossible. If you hang it in front of a window, you've got daylight. And daylight, you're going to fake, you're going to ruin your work of art. So um, those kinds of issues kind of get to be the major part of what you're doing. Also, if you're in a, a museum environment and you have lighting that's like this, if you're in a home, very rarely is there any kind of lighting that's actually dedicated to the works of art. I mean, you don't have, you might have a track, but the track is going to be supplementary to something else. If you have track and if you thought about the lighting, oftentimes there are several levels in the ceiling, so the ceiling's at different heights, so you have to be focusing your lights from different distances. You run into a lot of very serious but seem to be mundane problems, but on a day-to-day -day basis, they get to be major, major challenges. So here we go. Again, if you look at a space like this, this is the exhibition. Uh, an exhibition's going to have a label. The work's going to be fairly much by itself. You're going to be able to look at the individual work. You're going to enjoy it. Um, you're going to have nice kind of spacing and, and so on and so forth. Cantor has these nice, temper these nice movable wall systems. So again, it's focusing on the art. In this case, in this environment, these are just things that I picked up off the internet, so they don't have anything to do with anything I'm working with, but you can see that you know, the, main, the main focus here is how the people live in the house. They may have a big uh, case here for a to display artwork, which is not a typical in a private home. Uh, but even that is kind of shoved back in the corner out of the way so that it doesn't interfere with what's going on in the focus of the house. Um, windows, again, there's some big windows there, big windows there, one little wall for displaying artwork. That's kind of the nature of the private home, isn't it? I mean, it, for most of us, any of us living in a private home, that's kind of the way it is. You have to, you have a place that you're living in, you don't have a dedicated gallery. I have to say, I love contemporary architecture, but I hate working <laughs> in a space that has contemporary architecture. Uh, again, this is not dissimilar to the style of homes that my, my clients are working, working in. My clients can collect in a range of areas. Uh, 
And then again, each one of them presents its own problem. So I have a client who collects Buddhist sculpture, Pan-Asian Buddhist sculpture. He set his, his maximum number at 28. We have been at that number for a long time, so something comes in, something goes out. Buddhist sculpture, by and large, can be shown, if it's bronze or stone or whatever, can be shown in most any environment. So you can work with that quite easily. You don't have major environmental concerns. I have another collect collector who collects Chinese bronzes, early Chinese bronzes. And there you deal with issues of humidity, handling. You can't touch them because they're going to uh, be destroyed by that. I have a collector who has Buddhist sculpture, Native American ceramics and textiles, Japanese weapons, um, prints and posters and graphic works from the 19th and 20th century in Europe, and so on. Every one of those areas has very specific environmental concerns. So you have to look at the home in a different way. You have to look at the environment in a different way. You have to look at installations in a different way. This kind of home, this mo the modern home, which modern architects love to do, is horrible for almost all of us. Uh, if you look at a space like this, well, that's a nice space, right? I wouldn't mind having that in my home. But there's only one little space for a part. You couldn't hang a work on paper in front of that. You couldn't hang anything that's life sensitive in front of that. Uh, you can't hang art, obviously, on those walls. You've got major statements in the architectural interior. Um, everything is difficult for working with art. So when people do come to me and say, why don't you have your client buy this or do that, uh, I, I, again, my general response is talk to an institution they may support. They're not likely to do it in their home. Just not, it's not appropriate for what they're doing. Kind of a last slide, and again, I'm going to be very short on my time, so you have plenty of plenty of time to ask questions. Um, what architecture is involved with making the architect making statements? And I have a client who's doing a major building project right now, and I did three three major building projects as a museum curator, and always the architect is the challenge. The architect is almost never the your kind of colleague or your supporter or somebody you work with or somebody you work against. Uh, and that is the case in the, in the, the current, uh, out of, matter of fact, the architect no longer speaks to me in this building I'm working on now. Uh, they go through the intermediary because I'm saying no. Uh, that's my job is to say, you put windows in there, I can't put works of art on those windows and I have to deal with the daylight in front of those windows. It just is not going to work. And of course, they want to have their, their magnificent grand staircase where you put a magnificent grand staircase in a space where you want to show works on paper, your space is gone. You don't have it anymore. You put windows in there, you don't have, you can't show. So again, it's an interesting and very challenging kind of difference. My collectors do lend, um, and that again gets to be an issue of very different. When you're working in a museum, you're looking to work with a theme, you're working to find the right kind of uh, people to lend to you and the right kind of object to fit in with that theme. When I'm dealing with our collections and the private collections, in a sense, I have to look at, well, that piece has been on view in the home for six months. It shouldn't go up for another four years. I can't lend it. Uh, or that piece, the last time we lent that piece, it came back damaged. I can't lend it. Or that piece has this kind of value on the insurance. Is this, is this group going to be able to cover that kind of insurance, uh, co the cost of the insurance? It is a very different world. It's a, it's a wonderful world. It's an interesting world as far as actually impacting or influencing. My collectors each have their individual minds and they're quite strongly determined about what they're going to do. I have some fun trying to influence them, but often as not, they go ahead and buy whatever they want and don't listen to me anyway. So I deal with it after the fact. It is an enjoyable, enjoyable position to be in. I have wonderful people that I deal with, but it is, has its own sets of challenges and own sets of Now we're going to transition over to the panel discussion since everyone is a lecture to join us at the front. Yeah, I gave Michael permission to use all these photographs of my own. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to start with um, kind of the four pillars that we have laid out for this symposium were curating, collecting, research, and criticism. Um, and one of the questions that I wanted to put to the full group was that being that you're all working with living artists in some capacity, how does the presence of the artist then affect the 
criticism of their work? And is it is it easier when dealing with pieces by pieces from the Ming or Qing or or ancient periods when when there isn't that that other that other voice to, to speak for itself? Are there what are the advantages and disadvantages that you come across? Well, I have an example of you know something that's you know happening right now with um, Herman Mirza and his work is on view is that you know he's I mean you know whether or not it's like you know criticism in the sense of being good or bad he just really cares that it's accurate and so I think that's an interesting aspect you know of, of working with you know sort of material that's not sort of intuitively understood you know in the way that perhaps a painting might be where it's like you don't really ask too much about like but how does the paint stay on the <laughs> and um, you know we get sort of you know these the, the types of um, interest in the work you know is often makes assumptions on how it physically functions and so I think that's the kind of thing that's kind of um, become interesting for me is thinking about like you know how fetishistic is the, the question about the technology versus about the, the work of art and really you know how does you know, the artist um, want to shape you know both the perception of the work and kind of the, the role of you know the, the interplay of media in that conversation. Seeing that that's a piece that's still up and available to visit, what were the were there any major challenges or any things that presented themselves in that installation? We have to check you have. Yeah, I mean I think maybe one of the, the most interesting things to me is that so this is a system, it's a you know custom built media system that um, amplifying the sound of live electricity. And so it's kind of, it's, it's like receiving a broadcast signal the way a, a TV, you know, or back in the day, <laughs> the way a TV would receive a signal and then sort of play it. And so that's the whole thing. And so I think there's this assumption that the, the, the work itself is somehow like either synthesizing or, or um, you know, creating a work in the way that his, his whole um, goal is to make electricity visible, and so it's, um, for him, it's that he kind of acted as a composer to be able to make these things evident, um, rather than sort of uh, being the sort of author or architect in the way that people have been sort of assuming. So I think that's the critical point that, um, you know, that does have an impact on how the work can be experienced, but then it's also sort of, you know, the, the interesting part about having in a public museum is that, you know, you can provide a certain amount of context and concept, but no matter what, there will be misunderstandings, there will be misperceptions, and, you know, I'm actually, I think that's fine. I think that's kind of more interesting to think that people are hardwired to assume that there is, like, some something, you know, in between the, in this case, the electricity and the reception of the, the piece. So. Michael, how does that affect your work? And you've gone from, from one to the other, you, you only worked with antiques in the past, really. So I guess I worked, with, I worked quite a bit with contemporary, but I actually, back in 96, when we were doing the Inside Out exhibition, the Asian Art Museum did a series of uh, kind of public workshops about what contemporary art would look like at the, at the Asian. And I got stuck with making something that I wasn't thinking about uh, at that point. Well, I opened my mouth without thinking, I should say. And I said, I deal only with dead artists, and the longer they've been dead, the better for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that certainly has a, its value. The, 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 um, one of the major differences between working with art of the past and, and art of the, of the present, and really art of the future, is an art of the past and even art of the present, the object is created, it exists. If you're commissioning something, you've got something that doesn't exist. So you're dealing with something that is very, very different. Um, thing, it's, it's the whole, the issues become different. It's not about interpretation, it's about what the artist is doing, where the artist is, what the client is doing, what the client needs, what their expectations are, and finding the midpoint in, in there somewhere that, so that the work will actually be something that will fit in the collection. Entirely different. Um, so, philosophically, um, in, in a very real day-to-day -day mundane terms, they're entirely Equally challenging, equally wonderful. Um, yeah, you too. In 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 your talk, kind of along those same lines, in a way. Um, you you talk.
talk about visiting the artist's studio and then how, how that could uh, affect the curator's stance and, and, and their position or their thoughts or their, their ideas and their plans uh, for possible exhibition of those pieces. Can you elaborate on that and tell us a bit about maybe an experience where you have really been impacted or where, where the artist was, where the living artist was able to influence you in a way that, that you found surprising or, or challenging? Yeah, I, I think that with solo exhibitions, so for example, I did an exhibition with Song Bong, um, and I was receiving the Waste Not installation that had been at MoMA and many other places, and in conversation with Song Bong, we decided to do an entirely second section of the show, and so that became a collaboration with the artist in terms of determining what else we were going to do, and since Waste Not was based on his mother's collection of, I don't know, 50,000 objects, um, we decided that we would show videos of his family that he had produced over time. So when you're working with an artist in a solo exhibition, it really is much more of a collaboration, and what they want, and what they, how they want things to go, has a lot, lot more weight than if you're in a uh, <coughs> group exhibition. As far as the studio visit, it's really, I think, the, the, the place where you can deeply understand what the artist's intention is. Now, you might, be, in the end, have a completely different interpretation, or a somewhat different interpretation. But the first discussions that you have about a body of work or a work of art does stick with you, and it does, it, it, you need, it's hard to shake it. It's hard to say, no, let's just throw that all out. Yeah, so this kind of first impression and also working with a living artist, you want to somehow channel their intentionality, you know, for the most part. You're not working against them, right? Mm -hmm. Not that you have to be, you know, like celebrating them all the time exactly, but you want to kind of be a partner in this presentation. So many, many conversations, I'm sure you can talk about that, um, happen. Now, I would say the most, the most challenging moments are when you're working with the estate of a somewhat recently deceased artist, where they have um, investments um, that are very, very different than what the artist would have. So I worked, for example, in that, um, with the estate of Gordon Matta Clark very early on um, in 2006. Um, uh, well, actually, um, the first time was in 1990, um, 1998, or something like that. And so the people who are managing the estate have their own set of interests and perceptions and how they want the artist to be presented. And I actually think that's more, sometimes, more of a challenge than working directly with a living artist. So that brings up an interesting area of art and investment. Michael, when you were in the private sector, or in the public sector, when you're acquiring a piece, when something goes into, music, into a museum, in theory, it's, it's priceless because it's never going to leave and you don't have to revisit that have your blanket insurance policy that covers. How has that affected, it has, it has, that, but it has your activity been affected going into the private sector uh, by the investments of the pieces? Is that a factor that now you have to take into consideration? Or, or are you, that you're asked to take into consideration, whereas you, you may not have been? And were you not before? Or how has that shift happened? It's a lot of questions. Yeah, and, and, and as Actually, again, the, the approach is almost diametrically the opposite. For an institution, at least all the institutions I would work with, um, there was no money for acquisition. So the, it, it ended up being what you were doing is either finding the money to buy a piece or finding collectors who were going to be willing to add to the collection. So the, oddly, almost oddly enough, the, the money became the focus. Mm. Um, for my clients, I'm lucky enough is not the primary concern. Um, they like to know the artist, they like to know the they like to have there are reasons that they, they collect the pieces, they, they sit in the house, they know the artist. There are a lot of concerns that go with that, but the <coughs> the market side of it is not the prime the, the price of the piece is not actually way down the road as far as items what they take into consideration. They are
big leap for anybody, and they consider mm -hmm. that. That's, that becomes part of the market. Uh, that part becomes part of their awareness of what they're collecting and why they would collect it. It also becomes a very big part of how the other aspect of my job works is what does insurance, what does insurance look like, what do all those other aspects of owning that piece look like? How do you store it? What do you do with it? So the market's always a part of the equation, but it's in the actual purchase That brings up an interesting area we were kind of speaking about earlier of diplomacy, as we have these, with these four pillars of curating, collecting, research, and criticism, but then also one of your main jobs is diplomacy when it comes to those situations, and uh, Colin, you've spoken about that and mentioned that as well. How is, where does diplomacy really play in your role now? I mean, where, do you, where do you find that you have to focus on that the most? <laughs> I mean, the, the interesting thing to me is that, so, you know, in, in both of these cases, there's sort of an element of trying to be market agnostic, right? So it's always still about the work, and it's about, you know, in, in my case, the way I was sort of framing these projects, particularly with Koki Tanaka or with Herman Mirza, where it's, you know, a way of showing work, but also sort of giving light to an artist's practice. And so that, you know, itself is sort of, you know, it's, it's um, you know, the, the relationship between the, the object
Um, it's just, I'm, I'm not actually going to know, but like some kind of redevelopment. I think there's so much development still um, as Beijing expands. So what's happened with Beijing is, so what happened is about, I was told about 10,000 artists, architects, designers, etc., had to leave that area. Some people could not afford to stay in Beijing, so they we, we went back to wherever they were originally from, if they weren't from Beijing, and other artists moved further out. But what then has happened is that Beijing's border as a city keeps moving further out. It's not a fixed border. So areas that were not Beijing are now part of Beijing. So now they also, so people have moved into studios and they believe that in the next year or two they're going to have to move again. Um, the most extreme example of this is Huang Ru, the um, artist who was part of the Star Group, who's a very, very influential and fantastic artist, built a very large home with like a swimming pool, like it's really nice and beautiful, it's also a cultural center, um, <coughs> about 30 minutes drive from the center of Beijing. Um, he used bricks that had been reclaimed from hutongs that had been destroyed 10 years ago, and um, it's his studio, it's his, his home, and now he needs to leave that facility because they're going to build a railroad, and he's in this kind of easement area. So he's been um, in negotiations. One of the photographs I took was at his, has his, at his place. Um, and he now is renting another place, is considering moving to France, where his place is from, and is negotiating with the government to at least turn his home and studio into a cultural center, where he would be the director. Now, there's not a lot of a hope for that, but this is the kind of thing that's happening. So even with um, Lu Jianhua, the artist that we both talked about, he um, is, has been in his studio for 10 years, and he and Yang Fu Dong are in the same building, and they are, the other side of this is that their rent is doubling and they have to leave. So the artists are getting it from both sides. And so two of the artists I presented who recently moved to Shanghai, live in an area called um, Songjiang, which is an art district, but it's way away from the center. And so what's happening is that artists are being flung all over the place, and the kind of congealing that needs to happen or the sociability of art, the art world is becoming much more kind of tenuous for those artists. So sorry for the long answer, but that. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Yeah, as curators, as a curator hat on, what's your discovery process for identifying new and exciting artists without having, you know, sort of this overlap with other major museums? And, you know, how do you keep yourself fresh and informed and, you know, excited about what you're doing? And then, as an advisor, Michael, um, how do you avoid your client's kind of um, blending mentality? I'll call it, for lack of a better term, everybody's collecting the same artists. I mean, I guess I feel like my presentation was about that kind of discovery. There, I, I didn't really know that many of the artists that I actually met um, through that. And I mean, it, it's a whole process that we do. Everyone does it slightly differently. But um, talking to people you trust in, in regions that are new to you are certainly important. And being open to new ideas is also really important. I would say that basically what I what I do is and I, I'm aware of the market and I keep up on the market, so I, I need to do that. But as far as new artists coming out and, and I follow Karen and, and whomever, I mean, I, I, I've got to watch them because I cannot possibly be doing all of that. And I'm at a point in my career where that's no longer the most important thing for me to be doing. Uh, as far as the lemming thing, mm -hmm. I don't deal with, I don't work with any lemmings. Um, these people have very strong opinions. They're very much involved in the art world. Uh, one of my clients, Family Foundation, is one of the leading supporters of Asian art projects around the world. Um, one of my, is, they, is the trust, has their name on the building at the Asian They're not following anybody. They're not money. Um, so, um, yes, exactly. <laughs> so I don't, I, that's not an issue I have to deal with. Um, also, 
that is, though, a, a very real problem. Because if I go out to commission a, a particular artist, a work from a particular artist, there is that, and there always will be that dynamic between I'm going to go buy a Leodan, and this is what Leodan's been doing, and this is what I expect it to be. Well, Leodan's not doing that anymore. Um, so that's, there's the, that's the other side of that coin. There is an expectation when you, when you commission a piece that it will be something like what you've seen in the past. Or is currently being done, and that may or may not be the case. It's always an interesting dynamic. I mean, I think one thing that I wanted to mention, which I can only assume, is that having the infrastructure of a territorial residency is, you know, sort of one of these things that makes it all possible, right? Because it's like, you know, if you're if you're going somewhere where you haven't already sort of, sort of infiltrated or become part of an artist community or an art community, it's like you really do need to have a little
magic investigation that is necessary to also maintain that kind of a little bit of cynicism as you're looking because um, artists will sometimes lie to make their <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the, yeah, another part of the, of the difference between public and private as well is the public is often trying to get somebody to say yes. They're asking you to support their project. They're asking you to, and the, the diplomacy there is the diplomacy of, of seeking donors. The diplomacy on the private side is to say no and to have that cynicism and always be looking at how do you say how do you say no, but how do you say no without offending somebody at the point they won't be able to come back to them at a point later in, in later in time. But that, I believe, having belief in what they're really saying is, a, is an important part of that. Good note to end on for the moment. I think we have... I think uh, it's time for a couple of breaks. If we still have uh, questions, we might come back for, uh, after the end of the second panel, we still have a question for the uh, first, first panel. Okay. So it's wonderful again, thank you for all the speakers and for the one for the moderator. Welcome back uh, uh, to the